Hello and welcome for the community hangout in December. The December community yeah. hangout. December community hangout. Uh, we're just about I don't know a week and a half away from Christmas, uh, which is a terrifying prospect. <laughs> uh, but we're here anyways. Uh, we're going to share with you a whole bunch of exciting robots that we built. Uh, talk a little bit about servos and then uh, show off a framework called Johnny Five, which is for programming robots or other electronics with JavaScript. Uh, with me today is Tom, our handy engineer, uh, and Betsy, who's a new hire who does software and engineering type things. So we're really excited for everyone to be here, um, and we're really excited for you to be here too. Uh, if you have any questions during the Hangout, uh, you can tweet them with the hashtag ElectricImp, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, and if you want to try playing around with our robots, uh, one of the robots can actually be controlled with Twitter, uh, and if you tweet hashtag IMP, CTRL, and then a space and help, so imp control space help, uh, you'll get a handy little help page that will show you some commands that you can do that you can tweet back uh, to make drive forwards and backwards uh, and change directions and things. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do, uh, I guess we could show a demo of that. Do you want to tweet something, Tom? Uh, I can do that, yeah. Do you remember how it works? So I have to tweet um, imp control? Yeah, IMP CTRL. And then the letter of the direction you want it to go and a number for how long. And hopefully we won't drive it off the edge. Yeah, it's just... That'll do. There we go. So it's a pretty responsive little robot. Um, as soon as you tweet, it's using the Twitter streaming API, so it gets those pretty quickly, and it just starts executing them right away. Uh, so we used this at a conference uh, a couple weeks ago called RobotsCom, uh, which we'll link to down in the description below. Uh, to do everything from uh, trying to build sort of racetracks for robots to navigate around uh, to make them dance to Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> uh, so it was pretty fun. Um, and these little kits, uh, so this is a kit called SumoBot. It's actually um, not called SumoBot. And this is, uh, this is a derivative of it called Owlbot. Um, so all it is is uh, inside of this in the back, uh, there's big four AA battery pack. Uh, there's two continuous rotation servos, uh, and I think that's just about it for electronics. So we wired them up to uh, electric imps, of course. Uh, this one is running just off of an April board, so it's just got the power rail coming from the batteries powering the servos, um, and the ground to the ground on the servos, and then uh, since all of the pins on the April can do PWM, um, or on the imp one we just hooked it up to sort of two arbitrary pins, and then we started sort of driving them forwards and backwards using the, the servo class, which we'll also link to. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually one of the more fun things that I've done recently, I think, with Electric Amp, just because we get so few times to play with robots, and they're such satisfying things to play with. Um, and this kit makes it really, really easy, because usually the hardest part about building robots uh, is mechanical challenges. And this is basically just some laser cut or 3D printed pieces that you can put together really easily. Uh, it's really hard to do wrong, although I think I did it wrong the first time. I put the servos on the inside instead of the outside. Uh, but it's really easy to build. Um, if you have access to a laser cutter or to a 3D printer, uh, you can do it for next to no cost in terms of the actual uh, physical part of it. You just need the electric which probably come out to, if you're doing it with like an April and an imp and a couple servos, um, probably about fifty or sixty dollars, I suspect. Yeah, and actually, um, the idea was to get it well under sub fifty because uh, the idea behind the Pobble Bot was that uh, they wanted to do a lot more workshops for things like Node Bots and things like that, kids' education day programs and stuff like that. Usually, the cost of the kids around fifty dollars. So they've actually put the templates for these wooden robot pieces on Thingiverse, and if you search for Pobble Bot, you'll find them. And there's a little three D printed ball bearing holder that goes under the nose of the thing for it to be able to turn around on. So you can download all those files off Thingiverse, and you can laser cut them and print them yourself, or at your local hackerspace, or whatever the case may be. Noco, or the services yeah, yeah. that will laser cut or print things for you. Pinoco does both, so you can take the files from Thingiverse, send them to Pinoco, and the robot shows up in there. And so the, the really cool thing about uh, Powellbot and like all of the SumoBot kits is that they really sort of act as a starting point for other projects. Um, so we built this Twitter-controlled robot, which basically just uses the, the built-in electronics and components for it. Uh, we saw somebody at the conference, I think they were 10 or 12 only. Uh, they were quite young, and they ended up building uh, a boat 
that there's no bottom. Oh, yeah. So they had some foam on the bottom of it, and they attached little paddle wheels um, to the wheels so that as they spun, they would paddle along, um, and then it could make a drive like a boat, which was really cool. And it could turn. And it could turn. It could turn really quickly and responsively, too, which is apparently a difficult thing to do with boats. Yeah, you need a little water speed. Yeah. Um, and the other cool thing that we built, uh, I'm going to share a screen real quick. Um, is this uh, flamethrower robot, uh, which Tom built? So while <laughs> we were at that's this, out there. while we were at this conference, uh, somebody thought it would be really cool uh, if we could somehow build a flamethrower robot, um, which was sort of an interesting challenge. And it started out with, well, what if we just bought like Zippo and some hairspray and we built some kind of rig to make it all work, uh, which seemed like a really bad idea. Uh, and it might have been. It, yeah, it probably was. Um, but it resulted in this, uh, this terrifying robot, uh, which is on the table with us. So I'm going to let Tom take it for a couple minutes uh, and just describe a little bit about uh, how it works uh, and how, I guess, you might go about building one yourself if you want. So, sure. Yeah. <laughs> This is this is a total hack job robot. Can I actually go over here and show it on my camera? Yeah, you should be able to do that. How do I do that? Let's just turn my video off. All right. So here's the robot. Um, it's a normal pop bot underneath. And one of the attendees at RobotsConf came up to us and said, um, I really want to build a flamethrower robot. Will you show me how to do it? And I said, no. And they said, if I go to Walmart and get all the pieces, will you show me how to do it? And I said, no. And they were undaunted. They went to Walmart, and they came back with a whole bunch of strange pieces. They came back with, the guy's name was Glenn, Glenn Lopresti. Uh, I think he works with, uh, actually, with the Robots Conf organizers. Uh, and First Robotics, which is oh, okay. high school robots. Dude was super driven. Really, really wanted this robot. Wanted it way worse than I wanted to build it right away. And he was not going to be stopped by my uh, dragging my feet. So he went out and he came out with a bunch of cans of different uh, types of fuel, uh, carb cleaner, hairspray, all of the usual pyrotechnics. And I was still like, I don't even know how I'm going to put that together for you. But he paired up with some other makers there. And uh, they fashioned this plastic bracket here which turned out to be, they, they molded it around one of the cans of hairspray, drove this bolt through it, and mounted it with a piece of foam on top of their pobble box with a couple of zip ties. And then these breadboards just happened to have adhesive on the bottom of them, so they just stuck it to the top and uh, just zip tied everything together. They just kept going and going and going. And they brought me this and said, can you show us how to program it? And I was like, well, geez, you've done all that work. That's the least I can do. Um, they had even gone to the trouble of using some copper tape to uh, heat shield the area around the business end of the robot. So we've got a little zip tie here, and that held a Zippo lighter that you had to light by hand before you got started. Um, and then they zip tied another servo to the back of the plastic bracket here, and plastic welded this angle bracket that they found at Walmart with a bolt through it on top. So when you stick a can through here, it actually pops up through the top, so the valve is sticking out right here pointing at the top of the Zippo, and then this Zippo can actuate spray nozzle, uh, all of which is a bad idea, all of which I don't necessarily <laughs> condone to the public. But what it winds up being is a normal bubble bot plus one additional pulse width modulated output for servo number three, which is the fire servo. So we wrote a little web page for it, so you could press WASD spacebar to drive it and fire the... Uh, Fire the cannon, named it Trogdor, uh, and shot some videos of it. It was a real good time. Yeah, if you, uh, if you search through the robots comp tag, uh, you should be able to find uh, lots of pictures and a few videos of this. Um, and we'll, we'll link that down below as well. Um, an instrument may or may not come out of this. We have decided uh, quite how wise of an idea it is to share detailed instructions for building this. Um, but it is a really cool build. It's a lot of fun to drive and shoot fire with. Um, and as long as you're very, very careful about it, it can be a somewhat safe robot. The hard part about building a robot is uh, not programming it. If you can build a Pobble bot, you have all of the core competencies you need in order to build a Pobble bot that also shoots fire. Mm -hmm. and just as you have all of the core competencies to build one that has more wheels on it, or the boat with a rudder, or even a model airplane, 
um, it's just mechanical design that's hard, and that's really just cobble stuff together to have something that you think works. Yeah, and like I was saying, that's the cool part about uh, the Pobblebot is they've done mechanical work for you, um, and then you can build on that with things like the Troll Robot to add extra servos, which you control the same way, just with different commands or different code. Um, but all of the same basic premises are there to get it going. So um, servos, though, they're kind of weird. A little bit. Um, I always uh, I always struggle a little bit with servos, and I shouldn't, um, just because like you need to. There's like these magic numbers involved. Um, you you send them PWM signals, which either depending on the type of servo, magically make them go forwards or backwards or to a specific position, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of weird. And then uh, a lot of times I'll like write the same value to two servos. And one of them will be like slowly spinning, um, and one of them won't. And so I know there's I know there's some tricks. I learned a really good thing at Robots Comp where on on the back of each on on every servo or all the servos that I've seen, there's a tiny little screw thing for tweaking it. All the continuous rotation servos. Continuous rotation servos. So they all have a little screw on the back. So if you have uh, if you've sort of centered your continuous rotation servos so that they should be stopped and they're not, you can take a little screwdriver and tweak this screw, and it will make it spin faster, slower in each direction depending on the way you spin it. And this is how you sort of tweak, you know, is it called tuning the servo? I don't know that it has a name. But. Um, so we'll call it tuning the servo. So that's how you tune a servo uh, <laughs> to get it so that they're running nice and together. Um, but I think Tom's going to give us uh, a slightly better and more detailed description of, of servos for people who are sort of in the, in the more curious about how the electronics work. I can have a try, sure. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, let's camera back over here. And we're going to flip up to this whiteboard behind you. So, let's see. Is that working? Yep. Cool. All right. The guts of every servo is just a DC motor. And DC motor, um, pretty simple. Push current through it this way. It turns this way. Push current through it back the other way. It turns that way. Um, what a servo does, is it has a couple of pieces of the system. So you start with your motor, and then on top of that motor you add, not electrically, I'm just drawing a block diagram here. You need to add a, some sort of equipment to measure where the motor is. Um, and some very fancy servos that might be used in a big industrial process. Let's see if I can just hold that back a little bit. I don't know if this is going to be very legible. Um, they use rotor motors, so they can tell very precisely where the motor is. Um, simple servos like the ones we use in robotics uh, for robots con for something like that. Let's try this. So this shows up any better. Here's our motor. Yeah, there we go. Uh, you can just use a potentiometer, and they measure where the motor is the same way that we measure where a potentiometer would be if you were turning it by hand, like with a knob. Uh, they just set it up so that they can measure uh, the value of the resistive divider that that potentiometer forms. So this is your feedback, which is all one word, but hey. Um, and if you take that feedback and you feed it back to a controller, Now you have a fairly interesting little integrated machine because it knows where it is and you can tell it where you want it to go and it has all the information it needs in order to go there. So that's the difference between a servo and a DC motor is that a servo has some awareness of its position and can be told to go to that position. Stepper motors can actually be used to, to pick out a specific position, but stepper motors don't necessarily come with a rotary encoder attached. They often do, but not all of them do. So why do you need PWM to control them? So the controller, this is the interesting part. This, this could be, there's a lot of different ways you could actually implement it. And I'm, I'm sure there's not one size fits all. There's not one standard servo controller. But kind of the agreed upon way to control a servo is to send a pulse train. This is the way that most servos work. And they interpret the width of those pulses coming into the controller to choose what position they should head to. So a pulse train is just it's a logic signal. Um, train of pulses, exactly what it sounds like. 
And this isn't powering the servo, I just want to be really clear about that. Every servo has three pins, power, ground, and a control signal. All the servos you're going to buy out there for, for SparkFun. Three pin device. And the servo takes care of the uh, power all itself. It knows what to do with it. You just have to tell it where to go. And you do that by sending pulses of varying widths. So the time between the start of one pulse and the start of the next pulse is in the data sheet. Um, this is usually, I forget what we were looking at, it, something on the order of like 20 milliseconds or something like that. But this is one interval and this doesn't change. Right? It, it expects you to send it a pulse, it'll read the length of that pulse, do what you told it to do, wait a while, and then look for the next pulse for you to tell it what to do next. So what you actually do is control this width. And by making that longer or shorter, it tells the servo to go more one way or the other. In the case of a continuous rotation servo, this actually tells it how fast to go in what direction. There will be some value that's the center point. Shorter than that is fast in one direction, longer than that is fast in the other. Um, and there are limits. So there will be a minimum pulse width at which you hit the stop on one side, and a maximum pulse width at which you hit the stop on the other side. So what you can actually do is use the imp's PWM out to produce this signal, because all pulse width modulation is is exactly what we're talking about here. You have pulses, they happen at a regular frequency, and you modulate or change uh, their width. So we configure an imp pin as a PWM, pulse width modulated output, and we set the period to this interval that the servo expects to see the pulse trains at, and then figure out the limits to the duty cycle. Duty cycle is the amount of time that the signal spends high versus the amount of time that the signal spends low. So a 50% duty cycle would be the classic square wave that everybody is used to. High, low for the same amount of time. I don't draw very well, but 50% here, 50% here. 100% duty cycle would just be high all the time. 0% logic low all the time. So we figure out the duty cycles that give us the max and minimum pulse width for the servo, and then we just set those limits. And it's really quite a nice thing to wrap up in a class. You can set it um, a minimum value and it'll floor it, a maximum value and it'll seal on it. And so one of the kind of uh, tricky things I found about servos is that servos can be really easy things to break, especially um, the the non-continuous one, the fixed position one, because if you overdrive it or underdrive it, um, you can't really, there's like definite stop points, and if you try to drive it past that, you'll get like horrible clicking and crunching sounds. Yeah, so I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call that overdriving or underdriving, <laughs> it seems to imply something else, but if you try to tell the server to go past its stops, it's going to fight, it's mm -hmm. going to hit the limit, and it's going to try to keep going, and it can't do it, and you could, you could definitely increase the wear on the servo by doing that. And that's a good reason why you write your software in such a way that someone who doesn't understand the inner workings of the class can't set the servo past its yes. limits. Which is exactly what our class does, uh, assuming your servo sort of conforms to standard servo rules. I haven't, there, <laughs> I haven't met many servos uh, that don't use the same uh, pulse times. Yeah, and that's one of the really nice things about them, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. Anything else about servos? I don't know. All right. Um, so if you guys have any questions throughout this, you can tweet them with the hashtag electric amp, uh, and we're tracking that. Um, or you can, can you can try controlling our uh, robot if you want with the imp control hashtag. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Johnny Five, which is this really great. Uh, node slash JavaScript library for controlling uh, robots and electronics. Um, so it's what uh, a lot of the NodeBot community is built around, I believe. Um, and it basically abstracts away uh, the physical hardware that you're working with so that you can sort of write application code in JavaScript, and then you have basically a driver class that knows how to communicate with the hardware. Um, so for something like Arduino, it typically communicates over uh, a serial port 
I think for Electric Imp, since it's Wi-Fi, it just makes HTTP requests to the Imp. Um, so in order to get this started, we need two different things. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to do sort of uh, the brave live coding exercise of trying to get Ooh. this up and running. All right, so let's just make sure this is all set up. Um, so we're going to need a few different things. Um, we're going to need Johnny5, um, which you can download from Git, or you can use NPM to install, which is what we're going to do. And we're going to include all of these links down below in the description so that you can do this as well. Johnny5 is a node library? Johnny5 is a node library, yep. So it runs on top of JS. Um, it lets you interact in a lot of the ways that a lot of web developers will be sort of very familiar mm -hmm. with. Um, it's event-driven. Um, you pass messages and you listen for messages. Um, so it should be somewhat familiar to working with Squirrel, uh, which you're likely familiar with. Um, Imp.io is a IO plugin for Johnny5. So IO plugins are uh, basically extensions that allow you to communicate with boards other than Arduino's running Fermata, uh, which is a particular basically framework that you install on Arduino to make it easy to work with. Um, frameworks like this. So like an RPC client? Uh, possibly. It's, it's kind of like a driver for the, for the IMP itself. Um, so it acts as the in-between layer between what the developer works on with Johnny5 and how it sends messages and receives messages okay. from uh, And the last piece, which if you're not, uh, which if you're new to Electric IMP is easy to miss, uh, is this little thing called Tyrion. Um, which is the agent and device firmware or the model that you need to run on the electric in order for all of this to work. Uh, so if you just run Johnny5 and imp.io, uh, your, uh, all of your sort of like front-end JavaScript part will work, but you're not actually going to be able to communicate with the imp because the imp doesn't know how to receive those commands. So I'm going to pull up my terminal, um, go to my demo folder, so the first thing we need to do is install Johnny5, uh, which I think I already have installed, but that's OK. So we're going to go npm install. I'm going to do this dash dash save, uh, which basically adds it to my list of dependencies so that I don't need to um, have basically a folder with all of my dependencies in it for Node. And I'm going to install Johnny5. So this is going to go through. It's going to download it. Uh, it's probably going to tell me that it's already installed, uh, or it might just install over it. Either will be fine, hopefully. So there's lots of things in Johnny5. Uh, Johnny5 has I.O. plugins for things like Electrium, uh, the Spark Core, the Galileo, the Raspberry Pi. Um, basically, people have written I.O. plugins for most of the do-it-yourself uh, sort of hardware platforms. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, install uh, with that save, uh, imp-io, which is the I.O. library for communicating with it. Um, and the last thing we're going to do is come into our IDE. And down here, you can see that I have, uh, uh -oh. I have a model called Tyrion. And I am currently have two devices attached to it. Uh, one of them is the April board that's sticky taped to the back of my um, laptop. It's got an LED and a button on it. And the other is one of the Powell bots that we were showing before that have two, uh, two continuous rotation servos. The cool thing about this is uh, Tyrion is basically just uh, some firmware that listens for incoming HTTP requests, parses them, sends them down to the device as commands, and commands can do things like uh, configure pins as digital IOs, uh, PWMs, get information about the pins. Uh, it can write values to them, so it can turn things on or off. It can set uh, the PWM, uh, all the PWM values that you need. Um, so this code doesn't actually do anything uh, by itself. It just sits there and it listens for commands from Johnny5 and imp.io. So you've just moved all the application logic out of the imp. You've moved all of the application logic out of the imp. So this is almost taking it, uh, we sort of always try to encourage people to move application logic from the device to the agent. In a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, not in all of them. Uh, but that's sort of a common framework that a lot of people do. And this moves it even one step further. Um, 
which probably uh, is not necessarily uh, the best thing for a commercial device, uh, but makes if you're really familiar with JavaScript uh, or if you just want to sort of like tinker around, this is a really, really great way to sort of get up and running quickly because you don't need to learn Squirrel if you don't want to. Um, although we still sort of encourage you to do that because you can do a lot more powerful <laughs> things. Um, this is a really quick way to get everything up and running. So uh, my device, uh, both my MacBook uh, April and my SumoBot April, both running Tyrion. Um, I'm going to build and run just to make sure that they're running it. Uh, and then I'm going to flip over to Sublime, which is where I have my, uh, let me make it bigger this way. Okay, which is so, which is where I have my code. This is JavaScript. Code. Just to recap here, so far we have um, Electric Imp yep. on a device running the Tyrion library, so the Tyrion Electric Imp class. Yep. And that's talking to your agent, which is talking to a computer that's running the Johnny Five library. Yes, that's correct. And now you're going to write some JavaScript that runs on your machine. It uses the Johnny Five library to interact with Tyrion? Or anywhere. Okay. So right now it's going to be running on my machine. We could deploy this to a server if we wanted to. Got it. Um, but yes, we're running JavaScript, which is going to communicate with our, our agent or HTTP, which is all abstracted through the IO library. Right. Um, and then that parses commands and sends them down to the device to do the things we want to do. Got it. Okay. Um, so the first example we're going to do, uh, this is sort of hello world. Uh, or a common hello world for um, Johnny Pie. So what we've done is we created a variable called imp, uh, which is basically our imp.io library. Uh, we've instantiated uh, a board and we've given it an agent ID. So you need to either populate this agent part with an agent ID, uh, or there's some instructions about how to set up a um, like a dot imp file if you're running OSX, so that you can sort of keep your agent IDs in a config file and edit them there. Um, but this is sort of a, a nice quick way to get started. So you just plot the last little bit of your agent ID in the agent part. Um, and then this board.on ready, this function will fire once the uh, once it connects to the imp. Um, I think right now it's set up to fire immediately, um, but they're working on setting it up so that if you aren't running Tyrion on your device, it might prompt you to say, Hey, you know, we notice that your agent ID is wrong, or that your agent ID doesn't have a handler, so you're probably not running Tyrion. Right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to log that we're connected. Um, all of the code for this looks a lot like Arduino code rather than imp code, um, because it's all set up so that it's sort of generic across platforms. Um, so we set up a pin mode, which is, is the same as uh, like pin configure. We're configuring pin nine, and we're configuring it as an output, um, which means a digital output. We're keeping track of this byte variable, which is just going to be the current state of the LED. And then set interval works kind of like an infinite imp dot wake up loop. So all we're doing is we're saying every 1,000 milliseconds, we're going to execute this function. And all the function does is it writes uh, and inverts the state of the byte each time. OK. So that's, that's a very complicated way to blink an LED. It's a very complicated way to blink an LED. So uh, I'm in my demo. So to run it, I'm going to node test.js. I'm going to get a connected message. Um, and this is all that we're going to see. If I come back to my IDE, we can see that on my MacBook 2 device, we got a system reset message, followed by a pin mode message, which is what is actually setting the pin mode, and then all of these digital write messages of it turning it on and off. And if I, you may or may not be able to see this with the lighting, uh, you can see the little LED blinking here. Um, oh, yeah. That's the LED that's blinking from a JavaScript slash Node application running on my MacBook using uh, the imp.io library in Johnny5, which actually sends HTTP messages to the agent, which decodes them, sends them down to the device, and then blinks an LED. Got it. Um, so definitely one of the more convoluted ways of linking an LED, uh, but kind of an interesting one. Um, and it lets you do, uh, it lets you sort of integrate, if you're building a node application already, uh, this is cool because you can integrate hardware sort of directly into it if you want. Right. Yeah, if you have your favorite node libraries that do the things that you want to do. Exactly. 
All right, so we're going to come back to here. Uh, I'm going to quit out of uh, this example, and we're going to show a quick uh, servo example because this is sort of one of the cool, powerful parts. Johnny Five is all about servos, right? That's, that's uh, John, a lot of Johnny Five is based around um, robotic things, not necessarily servos. Okay. Uh, I think there's a Johnny Five library for NeoPixels, um, although I might be lying, and that's something people are working on. Um, but it's sort of about cool electronics that people want to play with. Um, so this example is a little bit more complicated uh, because I'm using uh, this library called Keypress, which lets you basically tie into uh, the standard input and output um, streams from your from your computer. So it's listening to uh, it's listening for key presses on my keyboard rather than writing a web page to do this. Um, we do the same kind of thing. We instantiate our board in a little bit different of a way. Um, but then once we have the on ready, uh, what we do is we create two servo objects. Uh, they're attached to pin 2 and pin 5, and they're continuous rotation servos. Uh, and then all we do is down here, we're saying, this is one of the more this is awful code that I've written, but that's okay. <laughs> we're saying when we get a key press event, uh, run this code. Uh, which is probably one of the ugliest ways possible of doing this, but it makes it really, really obvious what's going on. So we're saying uh, if a key was pressed and it was Control C, then we're going to quit out. So that's just so that we don't accidentally hijack our keyboard and we make it impossible to quit this application. Um, and then after that, we've just set up uh, WASD controls, um, and all we're doing is setting servos either clockwise or counterclockwise to make it drive forwards or backwards or spin. Um, I set it up so that when you press the key, it sends the command, and nothing will stop it. So when you let go, it doesn't stop, uh, just because I was lazy. Um, and instead, I've made it so that space uh, will stop the servos. Um, and this is where uh, you can see sort of the weird servo tuning things, where I probably shouldn't be writing 0.33 to make them stop. Um, but I just sort of experimented with what values I needed to figure out where the midpoint was. Um, so those just need to be sort of probably tweaked to make them run properly. Um, or there's probably a way to tweak them with Johnny Five that I just don't know about. Um, so the cool thing about this is uh, the firmware on the imp is running or is running uh, identically to the one that was blinking my LED, but now we're using um, now we're controlling it with uh, we're controlling servos instead of an LED. So we're going to bring this up and I'm going to run uh, servo demo, and let's see if we there we go. So uh, we're going to flip over to our main view again, and as I uh, I can drive this little guy around with the keys on my keyboard now. Uh, typically, if you wanted to if you wanted to do this with electric amp, and I think what you did for your truck door robot was you built a little web page. You had some JavaScript running in that web page. jQuery does the same thing where you can get key presses and key releases. So I just did WASD on a web page that right. you served up. Same thing. And so the, the benefit of this is if you like command line things, this is a little more, it's maybe more familiar uh, right now, at least than working with sort of the browser based things that Electric Imp has. Um, and if you really like JavaScript, this is how you can write robots with JavaScript. Or if you have like a more sophisticated controller than WASD that you've yes. written in JavaScript. <laughs> Or anything else. Yeah. Um, so you know you could hook this up to other processes running on your computer. I'd really um, like to hook up to like a Game Boy emulator. That could be interesting. Something there that'd be really kind of fun. Um, build Twitch plays Pokemon with an imp. And no, I guess going the other way. Never mind. Um, so this is Johnny Five. Uh, if you have played with Johnny Five. Um, especially if you've played with it outside of the context of Robots Comp, because I think that was sort of one of the first times that uh, the sort of Johnny Five plus Impio plus Tyrion was sort of available and talked about. Um, so if you've played with it, we'd love to hear from you uh, about what you think of it um, and what you've built with it, because we're always looking for cool projects to share around with everybody else. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Hang on. So this is about it for the planned content for today. Ooh, that was scary. Um, if you have any questions, let's see if anybody's tweeted questions. I was just checking. That looks like it's a little quiet. That's all right. Um, if you do have any questions anytime, uh, you can, of course, uh, ask them on our forums or tweet them at us. And we always have people who are looking um, to answer all of those questions. Okay, so any other closing thoughts before?
before the end of, of the hangout. No, I think I think uh, we came, we saw, we roboted. Cool. Um, I think this is going to be uh, possibly the last hangout that we do for a little bit. Um, we're going to be sending out a survey sometime in the new year to get some feedback about uh, things like the community hangouts, uh, the blog, um, the newsletters, and the forums to get a sense of uh, what works the best for the people in our community, uh, what you'd like to see more of, what kind of content you don't want to see, uh, and tweak it so that everybody can learn and uh, have a happier community. So. Uh, happy holidays, and uh, we'll see you in the new year sometime.